Uh, education is a very important to, to foster uh, the people's skill. And uh, as, you, all, all you can, uh, as all, all of you can see, uh, now is a, the great moment that, that drastically changes coming. So um, we should definitely update uh, the education system from older one to the new one. Uh, some people, some educators say that uh, there is four C's, uh, is the 21st century skills, the creativity, the critical thinking, communication skills, and the collaboration skills. So those are the very important uh, skills for 21st century. So um, education is a more, very important. So not only uh, schools, but also everybody should learn uh, for the lifetime, in the lifetime, until we die, to, to make our innovations and change the world better. So the second uh, keyword is uh, the educational. The society should be very educational. Uh, teach each other, learn each other. So that is a very important thing. And third one, the social capital. You know, um, <clears throat> Uh, because of the capitalism, uh, the people are concentrated to the cities. So, the, the, you know, in the big cities, um, the, there's less community. In the local area, uh, there's a very strong community among the local village people. But on the other hand, if the people get together in a city and uh, everybody's anonymous, so that's why um, uh, we are losing the feeling of, good feeling of the, the community. So we have to rebuild, redesign the community uh, <clears throat> using the social media and so on. So uh, if we could uh, have the, those three capitals nicely, and then people will feel that we are happy. So uh, the third, last one, uh, the social, for the social capital, uh, the inclusive and uh, supportive is a very important. There's uh, even uh, research is carried out that uh, those uh, people who live in the small communities tend to live longer, but not only longer, but uh, they live much happier uh, life. And Tsaisa, um, uh, do you think actually technology makes us more um, into community life? Or is it uh, actually making us living more far away from each other? And a and, uh, follow-up question to Javi, do you think Estonia is a community? Well, when you look at the Estonians in the room, they are all standing in one corner and then talking, <laughs> talking to each other. Well, okay, good, good. You, you, you saved the day for that. Um, uh, yeah, well, um, I think Estonia is... Uh, still pretty much uh, a place where you you meet people and, and everybody knows everybody. So having a nation of 1.3 million gives you the luxury that you actually have access to everyone should you, should you ever need that. Now, of course, the challenge is that uh, nowadays, uh, even inside a family, you know, you communicate by using your thumbs instead of actually looking to somebody. So it's um, getting somewhat problematic, uh, let's give that, but uh, but uh, I think ultimately, of course, uh, giving access to computer, uh, giving access to technology is enabling us to stay in touch for uh, many, many ways that wasn't able you know, before that. Mm -hmm. It used to take uh, around 40 days, I think, to take a message from here to Estonia. 40 days on a ship, getting a message there. Now I can have video calls with my mother you know, on an hourly basis, should I desire to do that, or, or, you know, or with my daughter, which is much more likely actually to call <laughs> rather than my mother. But, um, but nevertheless, uh, giving these uh, new technological uh, solutions, uh, they probably are more, more, more and more enablers than, uh, than just you know, taking us away from the physical world. Daisha, what do you think is the uh, technology uh, getting us closer or actually taking us apart from each other? Um, the technology itself is a tool, but uh, it depends on uh, how to utilize. So, but uh, as a matter of fact, uh, as he said, uh, sometimes the technology is uh, the divide the people or divide the 
family ties or divide the community. But uh, eventually, uh, I even s still, uh, I, I, I believe the possibility of the technology, and I believe uh, the, the potentials uh, we can, we can uh, change the world better. Yeah. Now we are getting uh, closer to the uh, blockchain because blockchain is the new technology. The technology that once you use it, and now the new booming or the ICOs, it's actually when we dig into the deep roots of the ICOs and of the blockchain is that more and more people can start creating their own communities, building their own small kind of kingdom, kingdoms in the most positive meaning. And, and it's, uh, if all goes well, then it will unite those people who yet not uh, don't have access to the resources. So what do you think about the blockchain as the uniting force? Or, or, uh, or where do you see the power of the blockchain? Um. <clears throat> I'm sure that uh, blockchain has a lot of the potentials and the possibilities, but especially to me, um, the blockchain is interesting uh, that democratizing the finance. So that it's a democratization platform technology. So for example, um, the reason why uh, we decided to support the Funder Beam is, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, I have, experience of last 20 years uh, to, to invest into the bench startups uh, as an investor. Um, and uh, uh, fortunately, uh, I, could become, uh, I could have a very good friends uh, in Silicon Valley or in Japan and in Asia. So uh, some, sometimes they introduce a very good companies uh, to me. And uh, hey, what, what is my allocation or something like that? And, uh, uh, but of course, uh, if I got some allocation, I, I should give back to the, my friends. Uh, it's okay, but of course, uh, it's a friendship. But uh, it's a very, very close uh, club, the club deal. So, so if, if it is an ins insider of, if we are the insider of the club, uh, we are very happy and become, we can become rich. Uh, but uh, very few people can get that kind of roots. Uh, of, of course, I, I'm happy to be the part of the, the inside the club, but uh, I strongly believe that uh, um, this kind of the fortunate should be uh, shared with many, as many people as possible. So um, in a sense, um, um, the democratized market of the venture financing uh, is very, very good for the people to sh get to get the uh, sharing of the fruits. Uh, and also from the startup entrepreneur's point of view, it's very good to get um, as many as people as possible to know uh, uh, this is our innovation and so on. Um, so in a sense, uh, the blockchain technology uh, can be utilized so to, to democratize uh, those kind of sharing of everything. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm very interested in blockchain okay. technology. How many of you in the audience know what the blockchain is? Okay, maybe half. How many of you have heard about the ICOs? How many of you ever invested into the uh, tokens or, or ICOs? Wow, very knowledgeable crowd. <laughs> very, very impressed. I was uh, just uh, two days ago speaking in Madrid at big event and, and uh, it wasn't that knowledgeable at all. So I'm really, really impressed. Uh, Steve, you do a lot around the uh, blockchain. So, I, I mean, we don't need to dig into the, the blockchain itself. Uh, so we can nicely talk about it. What's, uh, why blockchain and, and what, are the, um, what do you think it's going to be in five years time? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I was hoping to get to some kind of a key <laughs> yeah, to I'm the sure. future or something. Yeah. I, I'm, the thing that we believe and the reason that we have so many blockchain related events here is because we're fans or, or believers that distributed ledger is, is a way of bringing change to a variety of different places or industries. 
So we want to be helpful in, in encouraging the debate. Candidly, I think the change is at a pace where I would be insincere if I said, and in five years it's going to be X. Our concern, I'll say it this way, uh, is when anything changes this fast, mm -hmm. then it makes me a bit nervous, even though I'm a huge tech optimist, because inevitably some number of people are going to be hurt, and then that sets the whole thing back a while, right? So for those uh, Singaporeans and those that were in and around the ecosystem in the sort of bubble, dot-com bubble, Singapore was a place where there was a lot of activity and buzz and VC money. And then when the bubble burst and everybody ran away, it's taken us a long, long, long time to kind of get back to some sense that there's a lot of things happening. So when people talk about ICO, uh, we had an event a week ago or so talking about ICO, this idea that some number of people have a great opportunity, and unfortunately, like anything in life, some number of people will use that as a chance to deceive. And my fear is there'll be this sort of one action, right? For those that have seen PRC come down uh, hard and say no, which is one approach, then there's other countries that are saying, what does this mean? Which I think is an intelligent approach. It's neither please come in and let's do this immediately, and it's not please go away. It's somewhere in between. So the long answer is we're believers. We think it has a wide number of use cases. We're sort of on the Reed Hoffman side that have said, don't keep combining it with Bitcoin. Think about it as completely different in cryptocurrency. Let's have a separate discussion. But we'd like to discuss it in an open way without people becoming so in love with it that then we stop making good, good decisions, right? We just become fever and run straight toward it without necessarily understanding or appreciating. The uh, recent uh, reactions from the regulator side have been from one corner to the other corner. Uh, the uh, uh, FCA, which is the UK-based regulator, uh, they sent out the note on uh, 12th of uh, September, which is the first in Europe to send out the notes around the ICOs, and it wasn't very uh, encouraging, I must say, compared to the MAS uh, note here and, and uh, the Canada note um, uh, back late in, in August. So uh, maybe the question to uh, Davi that um, Estonia, not just talking about the ICOs, but uh, blockchain a bit uh, broader. I think we've been one of the first adopters of the very, very early blockchain. If we talk about the um, shared ledger or open ledger, because all our digital signatures use the private public key uh, link mm -hmm. and, and we've been using it. So how do you see it? In, is it the power for the government? Mm -hmm. or, or does it kind of force them for taking so different routes? Well, yeah, you might say that in a way we have been using blockchain way before it was officially invented. So <laughs> the idea behind the, uh, behind the Estonian way of identifying things is, is uh, very, very similar. It was not essentially built on uh, distributed ledger, but, uh, but uh, on, um, on a certification. But basically there, there is a yeah. certification unit, but basically the idea is exactly the same. And for us, it is a technology that gives you um, opportunities. Uh, in digital world, you need to make sure that the person who identifies himself is actually the person who he claims to be. This is one thing. If you have that, it opens you millions of opportunities. Secondly, you are very, very interested as a government, as a stock exchange, as a, any company, that the data uh, keeps, you know, Nobody can, can play with it. So, so data integrity is one question that is extremely important. Um, it's even more in some cases than data privacy, for example, because you know, if our, our um, uh, previous president made often this point that I'm really angry if um, it's, uh, my blood type is published uh, in the media, uh, taken from my health record. But I'm much more angry if somebody changes my blood type in the health register and I, I get this uh, blood transfer, which is completely wrong type of blood. So yeah, I might not even survive to, to be angry, actually. Um, so data integrity is an extremely important thing. Now, coming to this, whether there is a risk of, um, of uh, boom with, with um, um, uh, cryptocurrencies, of course there is. Of course there is. It would be insane to think that all the um, uh, cryptocurrencies will make all of us uh, billionaires. No, they won't. But that doesn't mean that the technology is wrong. 
Uh, with .com, we had the same thing. We had very, very uh, quick developments. We had uh, boom, we had burst, but that didn't mean that the uh, .com or, or, or web page or web-based business was somehow wrong. Yes, we had some of those that didn't work out, but the best ones who survived and the new ones who, that have emerged, they are now you know, many, many times bigger than they ever were during this uh, so-called boom. So um, with anything moving very fast, uh, there is always risk that there is some particular uh, part of it that actually doesn't make you a billionaire, but there are many things uh, that in this technology that actually act as enablers. Yes, so uh, the... Uh the blockchain is, is definitely the, this kind of a, a mind-blowing technology because it's opened so, so many doors. And, and compared to the uh, internet and, and the dot uh, the com, as you say, the internet, what it gave us, it gave us the possibility to exchange the information. But now all of a sudden, with the new technology, we can so trustfully start exchanging the assets, any kind of assets. Plus the assets are not going to typical assets. What we are now used to uh, think that, is it the next? Is it the house? Is it the car? But it's going to boil down to the utilities and actually the protocol type of investment. So let's touch the ICO uh, uh, bubble. So, uh, Daisa, what do you think around the ICOs? Yeah, um, um, every time the new te technology comes, uh, that people will be will overacted. So. Uh, um, now is the very beginning of the ICOs, um, and uh, so of course uh, most of them are fraud, <laughs> obviously. But uh, um, eventually uh, it will be sophisticated, and uh, uh, the technology-wise, or the te te design-wise, or regulation-wise. Uh, so um, I strongly believe, uh, for me personally, I strongly believe that uh, the ICO will be the one of the major uh, uh, financing uh, methods uh, for the entrepreneurs or innovators, artists, and so on. So uh, I'd like to ask the one question uh, for the Estonian, two Estonians of you guys. <laughs> I, I read the article that uh, uh, the Estonia is thinking of the Estocoin. <laughs> is it uh, official or? <laughs> Well, uh, let me explain very quickly. The S-Coin idea came from um, a blog of a guy who um, is a current leader of the e-residency thing, which is Estonia offering digital identity to any foreigner, including uh, Singapore citizens, including Japanese citizens, uh, anyone. And, and um, he kind of kept uh, pushing the ideas further, what the country can do. If we can give an electronic passport to a Singaporean, then you know, what's the next thing that we can do? So it would be wrong to call it a kind of official uh, government-initiated uh, uh, project. But uh, you know, three years ago, uh, EU residency also started from idea of, of two guys who pitched for it uh, in the government session, and then it became official, and then we allocated money, and now we have already one, uh, 100 uh, Singaporeans who have this card, and this is growing very fast. All in all, we have more than 25,000 people uh, already having this uh, electronic re residency of Estonia. The, uh, just to jump in, the uh, blog was, uh, or the content of the blog was generated at Fundabim office. So I'm uh, very, very pleased to be part of the um, Estcoin uh, generation, but it's more like a utility coin. Unfortunately, the um, uh, people understood that it's sort of going to be the country's cryptocurrency, but we've been thinking around the crypto, uh, the uh, utility coin, and and specifically around those uh, e-residency, as you mentioned, because it's it's the uh, e-residency is an idea, and and the S coin is also an idea, and and. We thought, why don't we uh, put it to the public and see how the public will react? And, and uh, now the idea is more getting supporters and evolving, so it might be that, that there's going to be some uh, utility coin. But exactly as, as uh, Davi said in Estonia, it starts with a couple of crazy guys announcing something, and then all of a sudden you see that the government is supporting those crazy ideas. And, and that's, that's how things will be kicked off. But it's th that this kind of the bottom-up approach uh -huh. is uh, very good, I think. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's. 
I was born in Japan and I grew up in Japan, and there was no such kind of bottom up approach uh, in Japan. Yeah, always the government is a top down. Yeah. Steve, you wanted to say? No, I just, I think it, it points to something very fundamental here, which is blockchain is this democratization, and yet governments exist because they have powers. And so governments have powers to issue currency and powers to issue things or, or not issue things. So I think it's a very interesting inflection point, which is how do we think of this idea of bottoms up or democrat uh, democratization, and, and at the same time, we also expect governments to try and keep people safe and make sure there's good schools and make sure that airports work well. So it, it's just an interesting, because we expect a lot of governments, but equally sometimes we'll say, governments, please don't interfere and let us be amazing and creative and innovative. So having spent my whole life in the tech community trying to build things and now four years inside government, I do have a different appreciation because my friends over at the MAS worry about something going wrong and that's what they're asked to do. So downside becomes a much more powerful driver than enabling upside. And it's not that they're not thinking about it or the financial conduct authority, they're all thinking about it. But there's this idea of we have this sort of schizophrenic expectation. We want government to let us be amazing and creative, and then we also say, but you know, keep mm -hmm. us safe and don't let anything bad happen. And mm -hmm. so it's interesting how we think of those things, and blockchain is one way of stretching that boundary some. It's uh, definitely uh, interesting to see what are the uh, reactions around the uh, governments. And, and for example, we can uh, tell the Fundabim uh, stories uh, as uh, we're the first one who built a stock exchange or stock trading platform and tokenized uh, equities, not the rights or the utilities yet, but maybe we're getting there one day. And, and then we visited different regulators, um, um, we can say around the world, and, and asked their um, if this kind of uh, system, financial service, could be regulated and get the license in this specific country. And I must say the Europe is, is conservative and unfortunately Estonia is part of not the conservative Europe but because of being part of the European directives, mm. which is very often too detailed and, and sometimes the devil is in the details. Not the intention is the, um, is the worst part, but, but actually the details is the worst part. And, and um, in, in these kind of cases, you and as an entrepreneur, um, you go and do this kind of a, I know it's a bad word to say, but say, but a uh, regulator is shopping, and you look for the brightest regulators and the brightest countries on earth who actually adopt you as a, as a business into the country. So, and and my point after that has been that everybody says that uh, companies compete with each other, and we have a competition between the businesses. But now I've learned that actually there's even bigger competition between the countries and between, between the regulators. So what do you think about it? And who's the winner? Singapore? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> I mean, all, all I, would, I, mean uh, I shouldn't speak on behalf of MAS, but what I would say is Ravi, for those that know the MAS, so Ravi Menon uh, has been pushing, pushing, pushing. And when I was in private sector and we were trying to promote cloud computing and we were trying to promote lots of things, boy, it was, it was tough, right? And the MAS was certainly less uh, innovative. And then Ravi has really pushed hard on that, has built a team to push hard on that, has set aside funds to support innovation. And so Ravi goes out and says very frequently, Singapore wishes to be a smart financial center as part of a smart nation. So his view is cannot have one without the other, and he's pushing very hard. So then the deals with the FCA and lots of other uh, partnerships around to try and make the entrepreneur's journey between one regulatory environment and another a little bit more smooth, not uh, without friction, but, but better. So I say, with respect to, to MAS, they understand that the regulator can be friend or foe, and have decided to be uh, firmly on the side of friend. Okay. Um, especially in these days, um, I really feel that uh, the, the smaller the better, and the less is more, uh, for many, uh, in every aspect. 
uh, not only for the companies, but also the governments and so on, um, <clears throat> or countries. Um, <clears throat> because, um, you know, now is a, the, one of the great moments in once or twice in a hundred years uh, that uh, the very dramatic change, radical change is happening. So uh, in this kind of moment, uh, the, it, this is a, it is an innovator's dilemma, kind of. So if the, the country or companies uh, the very, were very successful in the previous paradigm, uh, they will uh, be uh, la uh, late. Uh, they will be uh, less advanced uh, in the next paradigm. So, um, <clears throat> uh, for example, in, if you point out Japan, for example, um, um, there are so many stakeholders and so many legacies. So it's very difficult to, to disrupt this kind, those kind of things, or very difficult to uh, arrange the meeting midpoint. Uh, so, uh, so that's why uh, everything is very slow. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the company like, a country like uh, Singapore or Estonia, uh, they are very quick, uh, much, much quicker than uh, the other countries and uh, uh, less legacy. So that's why uh, they can move forward to the next paradigm very fast. So that is a very, very good, huge advantage, I think. So uh, in a sense, so that's why I'm, I'm talking with uh, uh, the people in a, living in a small country, which has uh, the great passion to change the new, to the new world. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, just to, you know, build on that. Uh, if you are a small fish in a global ocean, you have to be very fast in order to, you know, not be eaten. Or, um, or, or the other, other note on that, uh, I think uh, Singapore and Estonia have both shown that uh, if you are a small country between bigger neighbors, you need to be very smart and you can be hugely successful. Singapore has 52 years of uh, history building a nation, very, very inspiring success story. Estonian continuous independence uh, is 26 years, so basically half of that of, of Singapore. And, and also, I think we have managed to move very, very quickly. And it's extremely right to say that uh, countries compete with each other. You know, in order to have the biggest port or, or harbor in the world, you need some requirements, preferably good uh, geographic location and preferably also access to the sea. Without that, it's very difficult. Now, uh, when you build a digital company uh, to become the biggest in the world, the geographic location it might be secondary. You might be interested in, as, as Kaidi said, what's the regulation, what's the you know, taxation perhaps, uh, what is the how ease of doing business. And, and this ease of doing business, uh, this is not just something uh, Theoretical, but this is something that uh, different agencies, uh, such as the World Bank, such as different uh, NGOs, measure constantly. Singapore has a uh, number of times been at top three, globally top three, which you know is a highest quality uh, mark that you can get in this uh, sector. Estonia has managed to be like top 12 globally, which is uh, the current rating, and, and I'm proud of that because in, in EU that's usually number one or two. So we are absolutely at the top in, in Europe, and, and we still know what to do to become even better. So in this respect, I think it's, the answer is yes, countries definitely are competing with each other, especially in the digital uh, world when the geographic location of the company is, um, is uh, less uh, important than it is when you build a seaport. And I think that's just to pick up on that as well, to extend it. Uh, when we think about physical assets, so to build things and ship things, back to your point. So we had a young woman that was here last week from Ethiopia who's working hard to try and help encourage other young men and women to learn coding. There was a minister from Rwanda that was with us uh, some months back, whose mission is to try and think about software development as one of the paths forward for the country of Rwanda. So the only point there is there isn't a need other than to harness the intellectual capital of, of citizens, and who knows, the next great power base for something that could change very positively how societies work and, and healthcare is thought of could come from some country that we wouldn't have ever imagined. 
Definitely, and, and it uh, also um, takes countries the courage to uh, actually allow those talented people and the bright minds to work in the country. And we have a story around uh, how many of you heard the delivery robot uh, Starship? <laughs> it's Google. It's the cutest animal, tech animal you've seen in your life. When you see it on the street, you kind of have the feeling, doot, 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 doot. Um, and, and it's a small delivery robot that has artificial intelligence built on it. It delivers food or any small packages up to four kilos. It uh, rolls on the pedestrian areas. And when Estonian government had a kind of uh, government and the parliament had the challenge of either accept those kind of artificial intelligence uh, vehicle on the streets or not, then the government or, or the parliament, yes, parliament voted. 84 parliament members in, um, in the voting process. And to, what do you think how many four votes this law gets to? enable and allow those artificial intelligence animals to the street? 84. Wow. 84 out of 84. So uh, that's also what the government can do and the parliament can do, right? Exactly, and, and that's not... Uh, it, it's actually, you know, very interesting uh, example how uh, sometimes you need to be brave as, as a government, as, as a parliament, and it, it doesn't outrule the opportunity that, uh, or the chance that something happens with one of the robots. Actually, one of the robots was, um, two days ago, one of the robots uh, was involved in a crash. There are tens or if not hundreds of robots in Estonia uh, running around in the streets, so if you go there, you see a robot with a flag. This is you know, the same Starship uh, thing, and, and one was involved in a crash with a car, but the car was the one, or actually the person driving the car was the one to play because the robot was driving on a, on a crossroad. Everything was kind of as it Green was supposed light. to be. Yeah. All the lights, all the flags, everything was uh, was there. So, and even if, if it would have been the robot who, to blame, even then I, I think that we should still kind of go on experimenting with this technology because otherwise, uh, we still keep up, uh, you know, guys pedaling the, the cycles uh, or bicycles uh, from one place to another. So we wouldn't have uh, innovation if we were afraid all the time. And governments should not be afraid all the time. Sometimes the governments uh, need to take risks as well. And, and you know, it's, the world isn't going to collapse if, uh, whenever a government is, uh, is mistaken with some of the risks. Governments are mistaken all the time with all sorts of policies. Let's be honest with that. Even, even the Estonian government sometimes. <laughs> Not too often, but yeah. <laughs> all right, so uh, we uh, sort of predicted the future is that we're going to live together with the artificial intelligence on the streets, on our phones, uh, around us. Uh, we're going to have the blockchain which enables people all around the world to uh, get more uh, equally access to the capital, but also not just the capital, but, but the resources, because maybe what's the future because of the blockchain is going to be that uh, very different assets will be recorded in the blockchain. So we, whatever, go back to the centuries ago and, and I can uh, give uh, my uh, chicken and uh, two chickens and you give me your cow and we record it in the blockchain, right? <laughs> So what do you think about the future? How crazy do we go? I, I kind of a believer in the story that uh, was just shared, which is the only thing we need to do to make that system even more amazing is get the human driver out of the equation, yeah. right? And just have a fully autonomous system. So uh, I, I think we should not imagine artificial intelligence as something to be feared. I do like the words assistive intelligence or augmented intelligence. I mean, it's still AI, but I like the idea that it's here to help and support. I think all of us, I hope all of us would agree that if we could have artificial intelligence better understand and diagnose early stage tumors in a way that's a higher detection rate than a radiologist and his or her teammates can do, that's a good thing. But yes, inevitably jobs will be significantly changed. One view is 
that leaves us lots of time to do amazing things and pursue self-enlightenment. Some people think it's also the end of humanity and we need to think about welfare systems to support millions of unemployed. I don't know the right answer. I err more on the side of I think it will help us in a lot of ways. But people drive into each other every day of the week. Unfortunately, when we think about autonomous vehicles, we are very much in the line of what if something happens. Mm -hmm. So I admire the idea of something did happen and everybody said, let's keep going and mm -hmm. just learn from it. Uh, when I visited uh, Estonia a couple of months ago, um, the Mrs. Kelsey Karyalaud, uh, uh, Mrs. President uh, of the Estonia, uh, she mentioned the very interesting uh, phrase that the uh, seamless society. So I clearly uh, memorize, uh, keep it in my mind that uh, so. Uh, in the future, uh, if we utilize the great technologies like blockchain, uh, and then I think we can, I, I agree with her, that uh, we can make a seamless society. The seamless means a lot. Uh, <clears throat> as I said in the beginning, um, the very smooth, uh, very f uh, fast, speedy, uh, efficient, productive, and uh, uh, frictionless. Uh, if you look at today's world, uh, there are so many conflicts or there's so many frictions because of the lack of the, uh, the information. If the information prevails to everybody uh, needed, uh, there is no friction or the conflicts. But uh, 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 so in the future, there's no arbitrage. So uh, if we could utilize uh, this kind of technology and we, make, we can make an uh, frictionless uh, infrastructure in the, in society, then uh, we can we can make a seamless society, uh, which means uh, no conflicts, no friction, and also inclusive to everybody, and everybody lives happily. So um, um, I, I'm always uh, uh, following my, the words that. The very well-known uh, researcher and educator called Alan Kay, uh, he said that the, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So uh, we like we should invent that kind of the society. Well, I'm probably not a real futuro futurologist, you know, future seer. If I if I say that uh, it's self-evident that we will have self-driving cars, that we will have uh, a global businesses that are fueled by blockchain, that we have um, uh, much more use of um, AI, this, this will happen. And, and it doesn't matter whether the countries or governments try to regulate against it, it will happen anyways. To those countries who try to regulate against it, like uh, London uh, with Uber, for example, they will simply have Uber later, or, or, or service like Uber, or whatever, whatever similar thing. So uh, you can kind of postpone the progress in your country, but that wouldn't be the smartest um, uh, choice. Now, uh, I see blockchain um, as, as an enabler, especially in, in taking things global. Think of how we sign agreements today. We still use our pen and we scribble something. Does that actually seem safe to you, secure? Does anyone of you know what Kaidi's signature looks like? I don't. So getting a handwritten signature from her, you know, trusting that this is actually her who, who sent that by mail, you know, taking 40 days or, or two days, or I don't know how many, how many days, this isn't the today's technology uh, or today's uh, safe solution. Having blockchain and having digital identity and having uh, things signed or agreed or, or uh, registered using the current technological options, just like blockchain, is taking things completely to another level in terms of security, in terms of uh, how fast things are, in terms of uh, how far our imagination can go. So this is a huge neighbor. And I think also governments can benefit uh, to a great extent uh, from, from blockchain. Even so, um, 
some government uh, registers might become obsolete in the future because you can register um, some of the uh, ownerships in, in blockchain or, or you know, things that are uh, backed by blockchain. But, but I think governments can um, uh, benefit from using uh, the technology as, as uh, keeping the data integrity. So, for example, we, we have been used that uh, for our e-health, uh, we have used it for many other things uh, in Estonia, and then we continue to do so. So, uh, small can be big uh, in case it uh, keeps the open mind and, and says no to the challenges. I mean, all the innovative countries in this top 10 tend to be the small countries. You take a look at Finland, you take a look at Estonia, you take a look at places like Singapore. So small tends to mean some constraint. I mean, there isn't much. We can't dig anything out of the ground. There's nothing that we can do other than try and think about how to use the natural assets of a place like Singapore. So I think that's a a positive, and I think this idea of being small, but if we don't use that to our advantage, then we're just small, right? If we're not small and nimble, then we're just small. So it's important to be aggressive, right? And I use that word intentionally, not, not negatively, but be aggressive and push and, and strive. The challenge that I see on, on behalf of Singapore is, you know, there was a lot less to lose, so make big decisions, take big bets, and then now it's, you know, a really great place with a lot of comforts, and the answer is it's a lot further to slide down. But Vietnam's pushing, Indonesia, Indonesia's pushing, everybody's pushing, which is exciting, but there's no such thing as status quo. So we're not steady as she goes. If everybody else is going up and you're steady as she goes, you're, you're naturally going down. So I think sometimes we become a little immune to realizing uh, the fact that pace is changing and people that are willing to take those bets will leapfrog. Dubai, I admire. Dubai's come from nothing much to making, forget about the big buildings and the golf courses, Dubai is pushing hard on flying taxis and drones and thinking aggressively about this and I admire them for that. Uh, I, I think this idea of government leading is so critical, but I do think it comes back to citizens as well, which is, it sounds like the citizens in Estonia have given permission, if I can use that word, for government to be uh, open and adventurous. Because if we think about things not working, if the idea is, okay, learn, try some more, that's very empowering. If things don't work and somebody says, who let that happen? Then people lock up and it's much easier to avoid it. So it sounds like you enjoy a nice balance of uh, citizens' permission and government's acceptance of the risk. Yeah, probably you're right in this, and, and you, you, you know, if you innovate, if you start taking public services uh, to the digital world, for example, this is still, at first, it's still only an option. If you don't like it, keep using the kind of filing in the paper formats, you know, nobody does that, because you see that the, even if the digital uh, is designed poorly, it's always better than, than just showing up somewhere and filing, you know, tens of formulas. So, uh, of course, we need to do better. Of course, our people are also critical uh, the way how we do things. I myself am very critical on, on many things. I think Estonian e-government should, uh, you know, take next levels much, much sooner than we currently are able to. But that doesn't mean that the innovation uh, in any way can be bad. And, um, and I think uh, you know, there are so many things that um, we can learn from each other in order to progress even further, and this is one of the reasons uh, why I'm here in, in Singapore, to, to learn from Singapore. Um, many things have been done very, very well here. All right, so uh, time is actually running much faster than uh, I thought. We've spent here on the stage almost an hour. So, but if anyone has one question... Uh, <laughs> 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 wow, <laughs> I'll give it... Uh, Hi, my name is Dan. Uh, I'm building a social learning economy to help people prepare for the future with what they can do today. Uh, so it's around education, and my question to you is, in a smart nation, uh, where do you think the governments are going in terms of how do we prepare people and what problems needs to be solved to get people skilled up to get there faster? <laughs> I'll, I'll make a short statement, and then my view on this, on behalf of Singapore, thinking about it is, 
I just think it's incumbent on builders like you. I actually don't think it's anything to do much with government. I think it's much more look around. I mean, an aging population needs different health. A densely populated city needs different transport. A world short of food resource in, in big areas or clean water in big areas needs help. So there are easy to spot big, 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 tough problems. What we tend to do is not want to think about those because they become a bit overwhelming. So then we think about, well, how do I add this skill? And should MOE or Ministry of Education think about this? Or what's the right tweak? And for my teammates that are going through PSLE week, you know, there's this anxiety about what happens next. I would love for us in Singapore to just say, what's a really tough problem? How do we work on it? And I do like the Uber example in London. Oh. Uber went to London. The regulators had to find a way to make it happen. Then they got sideways. Regulators pulled the permission. Now there's a million citizens that have said, bring it back. So the regulators will have to respond. It's, it's, a, it's a back and forth. But it's not wait, 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 wait until somebody says, you know, I'm, I'm empowering you in the following way. That's my short story. Uh -huh. Yeah, the way we, how we did it in, in Estonia with Uber was that we, our tax authority approached them asking, what can we do uh, for you to make, uh, kind of, uh, or to make business and how we, can we get the fair share of taxes out of you? So we approached them and we agreed that, okay, basically at the end of the month, any Uber driver um, can apply for this system that they, they send automatically, they report how much money they made and they will get the kind of receipt. Uh, and it's extremely easy to do because, uh, because uh, the, all the rights are in, in the system anyways. So I would argue that in Estonia they pay a uh, fairer share of taxes than the, the, some of the cash-only taxi drivers. Uh, so you, know, you can actually think of this thing through and, and you can actually make sure that this works even better than the conventional uh, model. And, and by this, I, I want to just kind of conclude that uh, usually the best thing government uh, can do is stay out of the way of companies and people innovating. That's, that's very often the case. So you need to create a very free market economy where people and, and companies are free to innovate. And, and the regulation has to be as neutral as possible, so rather supportive than, than banning things. Uh, and in some cases where uh, companies and, and uh, people need uh, some sort of new enabling regulation, regulation, then you just have to innovate together with them. So I think Singapore and Estonia are good examples uh, why uh, governments uh, are not considered uh, opposites of innovation. They might actually be part of it. But I just briefly, the point that you've made I think is so important, which is nobody wants to jump into an unregulated driver's vehicle. So again, people have a natural expectation that somebody in government has done something to keep me safe but they don't want it to become obstructive. So the, the example that you've shared is, if Uber is going to be here, how can we make sure that it's fair, and so we're protecting citizens and we're being treated fairly as government, but then let's do our part to make it possible. So the only thing I would say is, we don't really mean, we as citizens don't really mean, let's not have regulation, because that nobody wants to get on an unregulated airline or be in an unregulated driver's vehicle if you're paying for it. So we want something, but we don't necessarily know where that boundary is, I would say, as citizens. And government struggles with that, because the idea is, do you want more, do you want less, how do I meet these expectations, but as soon as something goes wrong, you shout at me. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough balance. Yeah, somebody has to decide on which side of road you drive, actually. <laughs> we haven't agreed with that on, on, with Singapore. Right. So, uh, Taisha, maybe the uh, final uh, words to you, because you're the investor that invests only in impact companies. So, how do you think the impact will come? The um, testing and, and um, breaking the rules first, or working with the regulator, or regulation first, and then innovation? Um, <clears throat> Uh, the the we entrepreneurs are just focusing on the how to change the world, improve the world better. That's only uh, the things we are focusing. Uh, but sometimes, if we pursue that technology or the potential energy, and sometimes we will 
confront of the, uh, the regulations issues. Uh, and then uh, we should start the lobbying uh, and talking with the government agency and so on, so that we can at least test first to, uh, to show uh, and the tangible examples, this is great and it, it will solve the, some issues. Uh, <clears throat> but um, most of the cases, um, uh, even a test, uh, it takes a lot of time to start things. Uh, so the one that breakthrough idea is a regulatory sandbox. So uh, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm talking with the government, uh, Singaporean government people and agency uh, about this regulatory sandbox to test everything um, <clears throat> in a very uh, uh, regulated, uh, regulated area. <laughs> Safe area. <laughs> Safe area, yeah. sandbox. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise, um, uh, the, the government should treat uh, the innovations like that. Uh, I read the, uh, when it comes to the London, uh, I read the very funny articles a long time ago that uh, when uh, automotive, the car came uh, more than almost 100 years ago, uh, the, the England Parliament has decided to regulate the laws about automotive. And uh, at the time, as you know, the automotive was a very primitive, the, the uh, very uh, uh, very frequently out of the uh, out of order, so, and the very uh, the engine was uh, sometimes blow up uh, frequent very frequently, so very dangerous. So that's why uh, the I heard that the, in front of the car uh, there is a man they, that we should allocate assign a man. To, to wave the flag and say, hey, car is coming. Car. And he runs. He runs. And uh, if the cars uh, overtake the, the man, uh, it's violation. <laughs> so we have to pay the penalty. So that was the law at the time uh, in London. So that's, that's why, uh, the, uh, and on the other hand, the German uh, society that they has they, as you know, they have created the autobahn, no speed limit limits. Yes. So that's why the uh, car industry, the uh, German car industry, access to the in England, even though the in in English car industry was the original car car industry of the world. So uh, the government should not uh, behave like that. Okay. <laughs> So the uh, regulator and the government should be part of the community and not exactly. left, left outside the sandbox. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, hope uh, that next time we, as Fundabeam, host an event here in Singapore. It's going to be the big office opening party. So you already pre-invited. I'll let you know when it happens, because in FinTech, you know, things take time. But I, I have a good, the other good news to you right uh, now is that we still have time to network, ask questions. There's some food served just behind you uh, downstairs and uh, some uh, soft drinks. So take your time, stay, mingle, and uh, ask questions from the smartest minds and big, Applause to Taiso, Davi, and Steve. Uh, education is a very important to, to foster uh, the people's skill. And uh, as you, all, all you can, uh, as all, all of you can see, uh, now is a, the great moment that, that drastically changes coming. So um, we should definitely update uh, the education system from older one to the new one. Uh, some people, some educators say that uh, there is four C's, uh, is the 21st century skills, the creativity, the critical thinking, communication skills, and the collaboration skills. So those are the very important uh, skills for 21st century. So um, education is a more, very important. So not only uh, schools, but also everybody should learn uh, for the lifetime, in the lifetime, until we die, to, to make our innovations and change the world better. So the second uh, keyword is uh, the educational. 
the society should be very educational, uh, teach each other, learn each other. So that is a very important thing. And third one, the social capital. You know, um, <clears throat> uh, because of the capitalism, uh, the people are concentrated to the cities. So, the, the, you know, in the big cities, um, the, there's less community. In the local area, uh, there's a very strong community among the local village people. But on the other hand, if the people get together in a city and uh, everybody's anonymous, so that's why um, uh, we are losing the feeling of good feeling of the, the community. So we have to rebuild, redesign the community uh, <clears throat> using the social media and so on. So uh, if we could uh, have the, those three capitals nicely, and then people will feel that we are happy. So uh, the third, last one, uh, the social for the social capital. Uh, the inclusive and uh, supportive is a very important. There's uh, even uh, research is carried out that uh, those uh, people who live in the small communities tend to live longer, but not only longer, but uh, they live much happier uh, life. And Taisa, um, uh, do you think actually technology makes us more um, into community life? Or is it uh, actually making us living more far away from each other? And a and, uh, follow-up question to Javi, do you think Estonia is a community? Well, when you look at the Estonians in the room, they are all standing in one corner and then talking, <laughs> talking to each other. Well, OK, good, good. You, you, you saved the day for that. Um, uh, yeah. Well, um, I think Estonia is... Uh, still pretty much uh, a place where you you meet people and, and everybody knows everybody. So having a nation of 1.3 million gives you the luxury that you actually have access to everyone should you, should you ever need that. Now, of course, the challenge is that uh, nowadays, uh, even inside a family, you know, you communicate by using your thumbs instead of actually looking to somebody. So it's um, getting somewhat problematic, uh, let's give that. but. Uh, but uh, I think ultimately, of course, uh, giving access to computer, uh, giving access to technology is enabling us to stay in touch for uh, many, many ways that wasn't able you know, before that. Mm -hmm. It used to take uh, around 40 days, I think, to take a message from here to Estonia. 40 days on a ship, getting a message there. Now I can have video calls with my mother you know, on an hourly basis, should I desire to do that, or, or, or with my daughter, which is much more likely actually to call <laughs> rather than my mother. But, um, but nevertheless, uh, giving these uh, new technological uh, solutions, uh, they probably are more, more, more and more enablers than, uh, than just you know, taking us away from the physical world. Daisa, what do you think is the uh, technology uh, getting us closer or actually taking us apart from each other? Um, the technology itself is a tool, but uh, it depends on uh, how to utilize. I just can't control it.